So our strong message would be if you develop a symptom, you need to see your GP straight away, regardless of when you had screening, regardless of when you're due screening or what the results of your screening test were. Symptoms need to be seen. Screening is for people with no symptoms of the cancer that's being screened for. Hello and welcome to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Fergal Fox and today we're talking about catching cancer early and early diagnosis of cancer. Now, as always, if you'd like to get in touch with us about the podcast, please send us an email at healthandwellbeing.communications at hse.ie and we will get back to you. That email address is in the podcast information wherever you're listening to this. So today our guest is Dr. Heather Burns. She's a consultant in public health medicine and she's the public health lead for early diagnosis with the National Cancer Control Programme. I'm really delighted you could join us today, Heather. Thanks. Thanks, Virgo. Glad to be here. One of the podcasts we did last year was with your colleague, Dr. Trina McCarthy, Mm. about reducing your risk of cancer. And that got a lot of interest and a lot of reaction. She recorded that with my colleague, Noreen Turley. So I guess we want to build on the popularity of that or people want to know information about cancer. Like it is a a fear that people have. Absolutely. So I guess we have to start by highlighting again that cancer is very common in Ireland. Yeah, so cancer is very common in Ireland. So we do know that one in every two people in Ireland will develop cancer in their lifetime. So it is something that will affect many of us and affect our friends and our families. And we do know that the number of cancer cases being diagnosed each year in Ireland is increasing. And part of the reason for this is because people are living for longer. And that is a good thing, you know, people living for longer. But as people do get older, their chance of developing cancer actually increases. So we do know that obviously cancer can happen at any age, but getting older is the biggest risk factor for cancer. And I think the most important thing to remember is that there are lots of things we can each do as individuals to reduce our risk of getting cancer. And you covered that with Trina in your previous podcast. So anyone who's interested can go and listen to to that information. But also, if you do develop cancer, then finding it early means you're more likely to be treated successfully and live for longer after a cancer diagnosis. So cancer will always happen but if we can pick it up at the earliest possible stage then there's every chance that people can be treated successfully and return to their normal lives and activities and live for many years live many healthy years after a cancer diagnosis yeah that's that's such an important prevention message like like some of the information and and podcast subjects that we cover have to do with promoting health but in terms of prevention as you said an early intervention it's all about spotting something and doing something about it not putting it on the long finger Exactly. Like so spotting a symptom early and getting into your GP and doing something about it is really important. I would have worked myself as a GP previously before doing public health medicine. I trained in general practice and we would often see patients coming in that perhaps had developed a symptom, but perhaps had had the thought that, oh, look, it's nothing serious or I don't want to bother the GP. I think a lot of us can tend to do that. At the end of the day, the GP does want to see you if you have symptoms. They'll be able to, to help you find out what the cause of the symptom is. Obviously, sometimes people are worried about the potential for a diagnosis of something like cancer. If you have a symptom, the chances are it won't be cancer. But if you get in and see your GP early, chances are it won't be something serious. But if it is and it's caught early, you have a much better chance of being treated successfully. So I think that's a very important message for anyone listening today is, you know, if you know your own body, how your body normally looks, feels and works. And then if you get any symptom that isn't normal for you and that isn't getting better, so something like a cough, it's going on now three, four weeks, it's not getting better, a change in your bowel habit going on five, six weeks, just not getting better. So anything unusual or persistent that's not normal for you, it's very important to go in and see your GP without delay. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. In, in terms of the, that GP visit or thinking that you're not, like you, you reminded me of my own attendance at a GP and seeing him, he was going to do this test and that test. And he was, I was thinking, he's taking this too seriously. <laughs> he was taking it more seriously than I was taking it, you know, because obviously he was doing it right. And I was thinking, Ash, it's not that bad. You know, some of us, I think, have that that inbuilt, don't we? Yeah, we do. And we can very much tend to play down our symptoms. And also, I think when it comes to cancer, I suppose it's important to know as well that that is an umbrella term. You know, sometimes we can think of cancer as one disease, but it's actually a group of different diseases. Yeah. They all behave in the same way in that they're all caused by cells dividing kind of in an uncontrolled way. But, you know, a breast cancer is very different to a prostate cancer, is very different to a skin cancer in terms of, you know, where they happen in the body, the kind of symptoms they cause. So there are some cancers that might bring people into the GP quicker. 
So, for example, if a woman finds a lump in her breast, I think many women would be aware of the potential significance of that and might come in and see their GP. Similarly, with melanoma, for example, if someone sees a new mole or a changing mole, it's right there on the skin. It can be spotted and often might bring, bring people in. But there's other very important cancers in Ireland, like lung and bowel cancer. So lung cancer is Ireland's biggest cause of cancer death in both men and women. And the thing about lung cancer is when it does cause symptoms, they can be quite subtle, common symptoms. So something like a cough that's not getting better, shortness of breath, a bit of unexplained weight loss. And, you know, that these symptoms can be a bit more vague. They wouldn't automatically make someone think. Oh, and they what? fit neatly into that category of, of I'll put up with. Exactly. They do. Yeah. And, and similarly with bowel sometimes, you know, a bit of diarrhea, constipation, a change in your bowel habit going on for a few weeks. You might think, oh, it's just a bit of irritable bowel or it's just, you know, yeah. explain it away quite easily. But I think lung and bowel are two that we really need people to get in quickly. So. Yes, cough is very common. A cough that goes on two, three weeks with a virus, that's that's very common. But if it's getting to that three week mark and it's still there and it's still persisting, you really need to go in and talk to your GP about it. Some people have a long standing cough. Maybe someone who smokes or used to smoke or has lung disease might have a cough all the time. But if that cough's getting worse, so if it changes, it's getting worse, it's more severe than usual or you've coughed up a little bit of blood with it. So again, people can sometimes go, oh, look, I always have a cough. I have a long standing yeah. cough. But if that cough's getting worse, changing, you're coughing up a bit of blood or anything like that needs to be seen by the GP. I thought skin cancer was the most common. You're saying that lung cancer is the most common in Ireland? It's the most com common cause of cancer death. Right, right. Yeah, so skin, skin cancer is the most common cancer. Okay, okay. Skin cancer is is often diagnosed quite early and people... And you think there's a general good awareness of that now? I think there is. I think there's been a big push with things like the SunSmart campaign, yeah, yeah. push for cancer prevention and also cancer early diagnosis. Now, melanoma is our fifth most common cancer in Ireland and it's quite a serious cancer quite often. But sometimes, as I say, just by virtue of the fact that it'll be a new mole or a changing mole or a dark spot on your skin, it can get in and get picked up a little bit earlier than some of these other ones. So lung cancer is still our leading cause of cancer death. One in five cancer deaths in Ireland are lung cancer. But again, there is good news with lung cancer in that if you get in early and get diagnosed, you have a much better chance of living for longer after you're diagnosed. So again, um, it's that kind of three week cough, shortness of breath more than is normal for you, change to your long standing cough or unexplained weight loss. If you get in and your GP thinks there's a chance this could be a lung cancer, we have developed these rapid access pathways. So I think people are sometimes concerned too about how long they might be on a waiting yeah. list. Yeah, mm -hmm. or getting it. And when, when did this rapid clinic or access ha happen? When did that happen? So there's, th there's three different rapid access clinics for three of our commonest tumor types okay. in Ireland, lung, breast and prostate. And they've been developed and rolled out over recent years. So the cancer control program, we were established in 2007. And some of the first things we worked on were things like, you know, organizing the eight national cancer centers and then working on things like centralization of cancer surgery, which has improved outcomes, but also pathways into the clinics. So these rapid access clinics for breast, lung and prostate. So if you go your, see your GP and they think maybe it is a lung cancer, they can refer you into a rapid access clinic and they will aim to see you within two weeks. So there are these pathways for people with suspected cancer that can help to get you in and get you seen quicker. And as I say, with lung cancer, it is the leading cause of cancer death, but the earlier it's diagnosed, the better. So your listeners may be aware of the different stages. You know, you'd often hear of cancer at stage one, two, three or four. So one is the earliest stage and that's where the cancer is still just sitting in the organ that it, it grew in. So if it's lung cancer, it's just in the lung. Just in the case of lung cancer, if we wanted to highlight that in particular, at stage one, would, would that be... What kind of symptoms are we looking at there? Yeah, so lung cancer is difficult again because if you think about it, a cancer can grow away in the in the lung and it might not cause any symptoms for a little while. So sometimes when it's at very early stages, it might not cause symptoms. But when it does, they tend to be vague. So things like that cough. And if you do come in with a cough, there is a chance you'll be picked up at an early stage. But by the time it's gotten to stage four, it's grown, it's spread to other parts of the body. If you get in early with the lung cancer, so if you're picked up at that very early stage, stage one, you know, seven out of 10 people will, will still be alive a year after they're diagnosed versus if you're if you're picked up at stage four, there's a much slimmer chance of, of still being alive, you know, kind of a year or five years after being diagnosed. So if you get in and treat and get treated and get seen when the cancer is still in the organ, it started in. So it's, it's early stage disease, then it's much more straightforward to treat and it's more likely that you will be treated successfully and then as I say you'll have a better chance of living for longer after a yeah. cancer so, go, so going back to the stages yeah and you mentioned there catch the cancer in the organ it started in that's yeah. that's a very powerful line when you know you know people you think in the first you know when you get told 
you know, people in your family, community of cancer and it's spread and you yeah. just feel for them straight away. Yeah. So, so tell me a bit about, you know, the different stages and the spread. Yeah. So there's four stages, one, two, three and four. And as I say, one is where, you know, the cancer is still in the organ. It started in two and three is when it's kind of growing bigger. It's starting to spread. You might have heard of it spreading to lymph nodes. So through, yeah. through the lymphatic system. And then when it's at stage four, it's spread to, to other parts of the body. So, you know, people often hear of cancer spreading to the liver or the lung or the brain from where it started. And at that stage, you know, you can see it's spread around the body. That's going to be a lot more challenging to treat success successfully than something that is more localised. So, for example, if a bowel cancer is still in that part of the bowel where it started, you know, that could be operated on and removed, you know, and sometimes almost virtually you can cure a cancer at that stage, you know, if you can kind of maybe cut it out with a surgical procedure versus if it's spread throughout the body, which just makes it a lot more challenging to treat. Now, treatments are improving all the time, you know, and they're looking into treatments, not just for early stage cancer, but for later stage cancer. So no matter what stage you your cancer is diagnosed at. I think that's an important point yeah. as well. Like, like, and, you know, there is a lot of us that, that's, you know, that have a stigma about cancer, even, the, you know, yeah. the word, you know, it carries a weight. Yeah, that, that it's not just like a diagnosis of anything else. That traditionally we saw any cancer as a as a death sentence, where yeah. like the like no more than you just mentioned there about the rapid access clinics, but the scene has completely changed in terms of care, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. A diagnosis of cancer, you know. I think it is. It's a, it's a weighty word and, yeah. you know, people obviously hear that word and, and it can be very frightening. And so we did commission, uh, we undertook a survey there recently looking at cancer attitudes and awareness in Ireland. And we did find that about one in five people hold kind of broadly negative beliefs about cancer. And that's things like, you know, a diagnosis of cancer is a death sentence. I wouldn't want to know if I, if I had a diagnosis of cancer, I just wouldn't want to know. And the treatment is worse than the disease. So a lot of people think these kind of things. And that's very understandable, you know, watching a loved one be diagnosed with cancer or go through cancer treatment. And there's a lot of people now maybe getting older who would have seen their parents go through treatment back in the day that was, you know, perhaps very harsh and and that's informed how they see cancer. But I suppose on the positive side, we know the treatments are improving all the time. Survival rates are improving all the time. So we now have more than 200,000 people in Ireland living after a cancer diagnosis. So that's one in every 23 people that you pass out there on the street. So for your, your listeners, every tw 23 people that you pass, one of them is living with or after a cancer diagnosis. So, you know, that's double the number of cancer survivors that we had in Ireland even a decade ago. So I think it's very important to, to say that people are living for longer. A lot of people are able to return to their normal activities. We used to talk a lot and people might be fam familiar of the term five year survival around cancer because cancer is, is, you know, was originally considered such a dangerous disease that if you live for five years, you were doing very well. But yeah. now we're seeing people living for longer and longer, 10 years more with cancer. So treatment and survival is better than ever. People living for longer, more than 200,000 people in Ireland living with and after a cancer diagnosis. So there are a lot of positive trends out there. And as I say, kind of the earlier you get picked up, that's really one of, of the biggest predictors of how long you might live after being diagnosed with cancer is if you're picked up early, you're more likely to live for longer after a cancer diagnosis. So it's yeah. knowing those signs and symptoms, knowing how your body normally looks, feels and works. And if you have anything abnormal for you, do get into the GP as quickly as possible and they can help you check it out and find out whether it might be a cancer or, or something else. My first taste of highlighting the kind of early warning signs of cancer, I was delivering health education to traveller men mm. and we're using the um, the Irish Cancer had a booklet the, about the top cancers for men it was targeting men and we were using that booklet and going through it but the the travellers as a community were very sensitive about the cancer word yeah. you know and they'd, they'd be blessing themselves every time the cancer word is mentioned yeah. you know and you'd be smiling at that but then we all had that little hang up but it's great to hear that you know the, the systems and the services have improved so much yeah, over they, the years yeah they really have and there's so many people, as you said, out there surviving cancer and living long, healthy lives. Exactly. Yeah. So in terms of how can we find cancer early, like your your repeated message is about knowing your body. Yeah. Um, and like you mentioned there, you know, I think we're on a different trajectory for different types of cancers in terms of awareness. And mm. you mentioned there about breast and the lump, you know, yeah. that, that seems to be like very common now that people would be aware of that women would know that. Mm. And even with men, I think it's shot up in in the last 10 15 years about you know testicular cancer and but i think mm. we've a bit more work to do on the likes of prostate cancer. but this is just my opinion like yeah i just feel like once we get these kind of cancers out into the open we have to air them 
in terms of their symptoms and the and the early diagnosis piece is so important, isn't it? It's so important. It's so important. And we know that, yeah, pr- prostate is the most common cancer in men in Ireland and then breast in women, other than skin cancer. So skin yeah. is the commonest overall. But prostate in men and breast in women. And they're two cancers that, you know, they're so common. So it's really important that we do pick them up early. But we're doing kind of quite well in that regard with those cancers. So for breast, for example, we do pick up about eight and ten breast cancers at an early stage partly due to screening, but yes, partly also due to the fact that it does typically cause a lump that will be recognised and and the woman might come into her GP quite quickly. And also... So the GPs, they're playing a blinder in relation to this then because they're everybody that comes in there, they're thinking, you know, what symptoms is this indicative of? Yeah, the GPs have a really challenging job because the symptoms of cancer are really, really common and they're often caused by non-cancer diseases. So if you think of the symptoms of, of cancer, there's lots of different things it can cause. You know, most most even lumps in the breast are not going to be a cancer. they will be something benign, something non-cancerous, like a fibroadenoma or something. So, you know, GPs have a really challenging job in terms of looking at the patients that come into them and kind of determining which ones might have cancer and which ones might not and which ones to refer into the services because you can't refer everybody, you know, so they have to look at lots of different factors. So they'll look at each patient. They know their patients so well. And that's the thing as well. Often GPs know their patients very well. So, you know, they'll, they'll know your whole history and your kind of risk factors for cancer. So again, whether you have a history of things like, you know, smoking perhaps or other diseases that increase your risk of cancer or a, f- a significant family history, they'll obviously have a good idea of your age and all that, which really impacts your cancer risk. So when we talk about knowing the signs of cancer, it's important for everybody. Cancer can happen at any age, but eight out of 10 cases. So most cancers happen in people aged 50 and older and your risk of getting cancer increases as you get older. So I think it's very important for your listeners today to know that, you know, that's just a key point that as you get older, you need to, to, you know, be vigilant for any changes in your in your body and go in with any symptoms that aren't going away. So, again, th- this all informs, our, you know, maybe the thinking of a GP when they're looking at someone younger, older, all their risk factors, whether the sign or symptom might be a cancer or, or something less serious, how long it's going on for and all these different things. And then they, they can determine whether or not it needs further investigation and what kind of investigation that might be. So, yeah, the GPs are brilliant, you know, they and they refer appropriate patients. And then it's good that we do have the systems in place now, like the rapid access clinics that do let patients with suspected cancer be seen in the system quickly, assessed, have their diagnostic tests. And then, as I say, the, the treatments are improving all the time. But so, I, so let's talk about a couple of the symptoms again yeah. for ourselves, yeah. um, those early signs. You mentioned a few of them, but that, let's talk to me about ones that we might know about or you think that we, there's less awareness of out there. Yeah, so I think definitely lung has to remain an important focus. So again, I would say to anyone listening today who has a new cough that's been going on for three weeks or longer and isn't getting better, go see your GP. Anyone with a long standing cough that's getting worse, it's very important to see your GP or shortness of breath more than is normal for you. So those are kind of common symptoms of lung cancer. Again, chances are it'll be something else. Chances are it won't be lung cancer. But particularly if you're an older person and you're thinking, yeah, I have those kind of symptoms or someone who smokes or used to smoke um, and you think you have those kind of symptoms, it's important to see your GP. And then I think with bowel cancer, so any change in your bowel habit, again, lots of us have changes in our bowel habit now and again, you know, you can get a virus or you can get a tummy upset. So these things happen and they they can be very common. But if it's going on for a long time, so five, six weeks of a change to your normal kind of habit of going to the toilet and you find you've, you know, maybe diarrhea or constipation or a bit of blood from the back passage and it's going on, it's not getting better. You need to talk to your GP about that. And then there's other things that could be a sign of any of a number of different cancers. So unexplained weight loss. Obviously, it's very hard to say, you know, where in the body a cancer might be that's causing unexplained weight loss. But that's always something that I think needs to be checked out. So if you're trying to lose weight, that's one thing. But if you're not, you haven't changed your diet or your lifestyle and suddenly you find the clothes are fitting a bit looser and you're like, I'm not quite sure why I'm losing weight. That's really important to get in to see your GP. And then exhaustion. So feeling tired all the time. And that's a tricky one. <laughs> that's a tricky that's one. A tricky one. <laughs> Especially in, in modern society. Exactly. We, we all feel tired all the time. But I'd say if you're feeling just wiped out, exhausted more than is normal for you. We all have a normal amount of tiredness. We all know, you know, yeah. what feels. Yeah, that's my usual amount of exhaustion. But if you're fine. And again, it goes back to the, what you said about, the, you know, the, like the, looking at through a GP's eyes. He's, he's looking at the age range. He's looking at other things going on for you. He's looking at what you're at. Yeah. Looking at your family circumstances, your your family history. 
Exactly, you know, exactly. There's a lot of factors, isn't it? There's lots of factors, lots of factors. And maybe things like ovarian cancer too is an important one maybe to mention. Quite an important cancer in women and again causes quite subtle symptoms like maybe feeling kind of bloated. So I think, it, it, you know, if a woman is feeling a bit bloated, especially again in that maybe middle-aged and older age group, 50s, 60s, that kind of age group, they might think, oh, it's a touch of irritable bowel. But, you know, irritable bowel isn't a common disease in that age group. It's more common in younger people. So that, that kind of bloating and just feeling like, you know, again, a change in, in, in your toilet habit or something like that for, for women, it's very important to get in and see your GP with that as well. So you, you've covered a lot of symptoms there. Are there any resources that you can point people to to learn more about possible symptoms of cancer? Yeah, so in the National Cancer Control Programme, we have developed, we've developed some easy read posters and fact sheets and they're all ab- available on our website. So you can get them on our website at www.hse.ie forward slash cancer early detection. We'll include that link if you want to remember. Uh, <laughs> we'll include that link in the podcast information wherever you're listening to this. But so have, have a look at that. But I've looked at these posters and these are the ones with the, the nine images. Yeah. There's a couple of ones just explain very clearly what the, the, the symptoms might be. Yeah, they do. They just show very clearly what the symptoms of cancer might be. There's a general one for just kind of cancer in general that covers some of the main symptoms of very common cancers. But then we have specific ones for some of the top cancers that happen in Ireland, like bowel, lung, breast. So they're all there. They're free to download. And also you can order them from healthpromotion.ie. So they're a Available to order free of charge there. We've been. Health promotion daddy is a very regular signpost in our podcast. Is it? Good. Well, then people will know it well. Because we've, yeah, we've been trying to encourage people to maybe print them off and stick them up in GP practices. Or, you know, if you work with a particular community group that you feel might be at risk or, you know, we did a, a fair bit of work as well recently with Alone, working with Raising Cancer Awareness among their staff and volunteers, because, again, the prevalence of cancer in older people is so high. So perhaps if you're working in any older people's services and you want posters that you might put up about the place, they're all available to order free of charge on healthpromotion.ie. Yeah, I think a lot of our listeners may be working in healthcare or maybe working, as you said, at community level, working with people in, in, in various community groups. So the message is there are resources there and you can help us get the, get these early um, warning signs out there. Yeah, it? absolutely. And also we did develop a HSE land course. So we developed it for, you know, GPs and other primary healthcare professionals. But it might be of interest, you know, anyone who has access to HSE land. If you search there for early diagnosis of cancer, we've done a course that goes through the risk factors and the signs and symptoms of the most common cancers. And it's it talks a bit about referral pathways, too. So, again, you'll just have that knowledge when you're raising people's awareness around cancer signs and symptoms that there are these pathways into the services for them. It's a good resource and it's available there to, on HSE land as well. Is there anything you want to tell us about how uh, some of these cancers cross into some other common kind of long term conditions is there is there any kind of common issues that we need to highlight there? Yeah, I think having certain long term conditions does put you at increased risk of different cancers. So again, your listeners might be familiar with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also sometimes called chronic bronchitis or emphysema. So people with that are at increased risk of lung cancer. So I think it's it's important to be aware of that. There's other things like inflammatory bowel disease that can perhaps raise the risk of, of bowel cancer. Past medical history is important. I think it's really important to say as well with cancer symptoms is that there's a big overlap with other diseases. So the symptoms of cancer, like I say, they're very common. They're usually due to something that isn't cancer. You know, even when you refer someone, even when the GPs refer people into the rapid access cancer clinics, you know, because they think they might have a cancer, the vast majority of those patients will be found not to have a cancer. So... There's this big symptom overlap, you know, whatever symptom you find that sounds like it might be a cancer, there's usually a higher chance it's not. It's something else. It's, you know, a benign condition. It's something that will resolve or, you know, it's not cancer. So the symptoms are very common. But I think there's some that are more alarming than others. So, you know, there's always things like unexplained lumps and bumps, unexplained bleeding, I think is a really important one, too, from anywhere in your body. So, you know, coughing up blood even once, you know, blood in your bowel motions or in your urine and for any women listening vaginal bleeding at abnormal times so in between your periods or after the menopause that needs to be checked out unexplained bleeding so there's those symptoms that are more alarming and generally might bring people into the GP quicker but a lot of cancer symptoms are common symptoms you know tiredness cough change in bowel habit these kind of things they're very common so it's going back to that that 
the, the message that you've repeated already about know, knowing yourself. Exactly. No. And, to, and to take care of yourself, you need to know what's normal. Exactly. You need to yeah. know what's normal. So we often say that um, when we're talking to women about things like breast awareness, yeah. is if you know how your breasts normally look and feel, you're much better able to spot a change quickly and get in quickly. It's the same with your re- the rest of your body. You know, if you, if you kind of know how your skin normally looks and you're used to keeping an eye on it in the shower or whatever, you'll spot a mole quicker or a new dark spot on your skin quicker. You know, so... And when those things do happen and they're just not going away, not getting better, it's getting into the GP nice and early to get checked out, I think is just very important because the GP is, you know, they're they're going to be able to do a very good, you know, examination, determine what they think might be going on. And they are the gateway into the the specialist services. If if you do think it's a cancer, you know, it's the GP who can refer you in. So yeah. it's very important to get in there quickly. We, we, we had a um, podcast last year about the screening you know the, yeah. the national screening programs and there's a couple of cancer screening programs within yeah. that so uh, like they play a part in that but they're uh, you know talking to you beforehand they're not the only thing obviously um but they play an important part so when when the screening opportunities present we should obviously go for them as well just to flag that yeah so screening is a very interesting and it's very important part of detecting cancer early so when we talk about picking cancer up early For most people, you know, so for about, you know, eight or nine out of every 10 cancer patients, your journey to a diagnosis is going to start with a symptom. You're going to get a sign or a symptom that's going to bring you into the GP or the hospital and you're going to get diagnosed that way. Screening can also pick cancer up early, but it's really important that your listeners are aware that screening is for people with no symptoms. So no symptoms of the cancer being screened for. So, you know, if you're going for your breast screening and, and you've no symptoms and you're in the right age range, that's appropriate. And the screening can sometimes pick up a cancer early before. Or it causes so any it's literally symptoms. it's literally all about then the lack of symptom. Like it's a population level. Yeah, it's a population level intervention to try and find cancer early in people with no symptoms yeah, yeah, yeah. of that cancer. So it can find the cancer at a very early stage before it's even caused symptoms. So before you even know about it. But if you do find symptoms, you need to see your GP without delay. And I think what we've found sometimes is that people can be maybe almost falsely reassured by having had a normal screening test. So a woman might develop a lump, but she thinks, sure, I had a normal screening mammogram there a couple of months ago I'm grand right, or right. you know again a woman might develop some vaginal bleeding but think well I'm due my cervical screening test soon so I'll leave it for the moment uh, so our strong message would be if you develop a symptom you need to see your GP straight away regardless of when you had screening regardless of when you're due screening or what the results of your screening test were symptoms need to be seen screening is for people with no symptoms of the cancer that's being screened for okay that's a very clear message so Heather, you mentioned earlier that you worked as a GP yourself for a while. Like, how did you find yourself in this role, you know, working for the NCCP and and focusing on, on early detection? How did you find yourself there? Yeah, so as a, as a GP, I would have seen um, a lot of patients coming in who maybe had symptoms that were on their mind, maybe bothering them for a while, but they might have just delayed coming in for any of multiple different reasons. So, you know, sometimes it is fear. Sometimes people can feel like they're wasting the doctor's time, that kind of thing. You were seeing that firsthand? Yeah, seeing that firsthand, quite common occurrence. And as I say, that fear piece sometimes too, just about, you know, I'd rather not know. I, you know, I don't want to kind of know if this is something quite serious. And I think sometimes when people are thinking about going to the GP, like it feels like a very big deal, you know, making the phone call coming in you might be someone who sees the GP regularly and I think that fear piece can be really significant for people yeah so as a GP, I felt that the more I could make people, you know, feel like you're not bothering us. We want to see you. This is our job. We want to hear about it. Seeing this this kind of thing happen quite regularly as a GP, I felt that at a population level working maybe in public health medicine, which is the discipline that I work in now, you'd be able to kind of help put in place the kind of systems that help people get in to see their GP quickly and then get into the services quickly if there's a suspicion of a cancer diagnosis. So the kind of work I do now in the cancer control program, even around awareness raising, so talking to people about signs and symptoms, trying to encourage them to get in and see their GP early, doing these kind of national surveys. So we have information about Irish patients and how Irish people behave or might, yeah. might behave if they yeah, have signs yeah, yeah. and symptoms. Yeah. It's so important, isn't it? It to is have, so important. To be building every bit of our practice on evidence. Exactly. Because then we know, we know, OK, one in five people in Ireland maybe hold these kind of beliefs about yeah. cancer. And then we can look at, OK, well, how can we address that? How can we maybe reassure people that treatment and survival rates are getting better and that, you know, coming into the GP earlier can really 
be be very beneficial. So I think getting those kind of messages out to the population and also being able in the cancer control program to be part of, you know, service improvement. So improving the cancer services, improving referral pathways, helping to develop GP guidelines so GPs know who to refer and where to refer them. That is very satisfying as well. So trying to to kind of implement changes that will make people better at a population level and also getting those messages out to individual people about symptom awareness and just seeking help quickly if there's yeah. anything abnormal for you. No, no, I'd like to compliment you on your work because I've seen your your focus on the, with the early diagnosis steering group so that mm-hmm. through that the National Cancer Control Programme are trying to gather the appropriate stakeholders around early diagnosis. Mm. Yeah, we are. We're really trying to do that. So early diagnosis is a very complicated area. If you think about it again, picking up a cancer early, you have patient factors, doctor factors, system factors. So you need the patient to know what the symptoms are and get in and see their GP. Then you need the GP to realise what symptoms are serious and what aren't and to be able to refer. And then you need the systems in place like the referral pathways and then in to see the doctors in the hospital. So there's so many different factors and there's so many different people working in these different areas and there's so many different cancers. Exactly. And there's so many different cancers. So um, we really felt it was important to take kind of a strategic yeah. approach. So we're not all working in silos that maybe we're taking a more networked strategic approach, working together, thinking, how can we improve early diagnosis? Because we all need to work together on this. We need to be working with the voluntary organisations like the Cancer Society and Marie Keating who raise awareness and things like that. Then we need to be working with our colleagues in the hospitals. So yeah. the cancer clinical leads, but also our colleagues in radiology and endoscopy and how we can improve referral pathways. And we need to be working with our colleagues in primary care, GPs, even things like community pharmacists have a very important role in early diagnosis cancer. If you think of how many people, how many contacts pharmacists have with people every year, you know, and again, they're very well placed to spot, look, that's your second, third cough bottle. Is this cough not getting better? Maybe you yeah, need to see your yeah. GP. That's yeah. a simple one, isn't it? Very it simple. is, yeah. it is. So, Again, with our HSE LAN modules, we had a real eye to that, not just the GP, but also community pharmacists, people that are in their, you know, service users' houses. So again, public health nurses, they might be in someone's house and they might just spot, gosh, you know, you're coughing a lot there or is your tummy a bit sore there? You look like you're in pain yeah. or spot okay. something on their skin. Like we were saying earlier, encourage the people to take their symptom more seriously than they're taking. Them, yeah, maybe. exactly. Yeah. And maybe just get it checked out, you yeah. know, as I say. It could be nothing serious, but if it is something serious like cancer, your GP can, is certainly very well placed to to help you figure that out, to refer you if you need to be referred, and then you're going to do a lot better if that cancer is picked up early. So, okay, well that's that's a great way to finish it, Heather. I'd like to really thank you for coming in today. We're going to put the signpost that Heather mentioned into the podcast information and make sure that everybody gets a chance to check out the appropriate website and and for those posters and other resources. And finally, I'd like to thank you, the listener, for tuning into another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast.